We are in our November series that we've entitled Echo Chamber, and uh, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's all about remembering and celebrating God's faithfulness in our life. How I many know it's important that we remember his faithfulness, that we celebrate his faithfulness, and when we know it in our heart, not just in our head, it changes how we live. So it's a big deal. And so we've dedicated this month to, uh, to helping us to remember and to celebrate and, and even educate us some on the faithfulness of God and what that looks like in our life. We're doing it through preaching and, and through video testimonies. We'll have another one today like we did last week of our people here at New Hope and just the, the, the tes- they're them testifying of the faithfulness of God in their life. And uh, I think you'll appreciate that too. So um, I, I'm really excited about it. I, the premise of this series, the term echo chamber, it literally means an environment in which participants encounter beliefs that reinforce their beliefs by communication and repetition, which is exactly what we're doing this month. We are creating an environment where our beliefs will be able to be encouraged and uh, corroborated and all of those things together to encourage us in our faith and uh, to trust God and to live in the faithfulness of who he is. So, okay, so you ready? All right, two of you are, that's good. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to stand with me if you would please for the reading of the text verse this morning. It's out of Hebrews 10. Starting in verse 22, it says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And this next verse sums up the entire month of what we're doing this month. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Praise God. You know, it's easy to talk about the faithfulness of God on a Sunday morning and even rejoice in it, celebrate it, sing about it, all those things because we're all together and encouraged. But it's another thing when we're on our own. And the, and the reality is sometimes the faithfulness of God can be perplexing because it doesn't always look like we think it's gonna look. So the title of my message today is The Perplexing Faithfulness of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Thank you for your word because that is what transforms us and makes us more like you. God, by your spirit today, would you do your work in our hearts that only you can do. And we give you all the glory, God, because it's for your glory and it's for our good. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. The perplexing faithfulness of God. You know, there are a lot of things in life that are perplexing, puzzling, you know, baffling sometimes. Uh, And there's a few things that I just thought of as I was putting this together. Uh, it's perplexing that Hawaii has interstates. <laughs> it's also perplexing that you can be down for something and up for something, and it means exactly the same thing. It's perplexing that we drive on parkways and park on driveways. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? There's all kinds of things that are perplexing, but also the faithfulness of God can seem perplexing at times, and it can be difficult to understand it. In certain situations, it's obvious. When you see something, you see an answer to prayer, and you see that God moved and he manifested his presence and you see the fruition of your, of your prayers, that's easy. But it doesn't always happen that way, does it? Sometimes it can be challenging to understand the faithfulness of God because he is a mystery. That's, a, that's something we, we, we get it, but we don't really necessarily like it. Because we as humans actually like predictability in life. We like to be able to anticipate things. When things are predictable in life, it, it builds uh, trust in us. It builds comfort and peace. So we like the things that are predictable. If, uh, if, if Joy calls me at work and says, hey, when you get home, we need to sit down and have a talk, and then she hangs up, that does not build peace or comfort or trust or anything good, really, because it's unpredictable. I don't know what I'm walking into. But if she calls and says, hey, when you go home tonight, I want to sit down and talk because I want to talk to you about what I want to get you for Christmas. Now, that's a different story. There's peace and comfort and all kinds of good things in that, right? But it's also predictable because I know what I'm stepping into. We like predictability in our life. But God is not always that way. There are a lot of things about God that are not predictable. Although the fact is that what is predictable about God is that he's always faithful. What's unpredictable is that we don't always know what it's going to look like in our life. And reconciling that in our life can be incredibly challenging for us. Because in many situations, we can't know what his faithfulness looks like in a certain scenario. Oftentimes we don't know until hindsight when we look back. And then there's even times we don't even understand it after that. There's things we won't understand about God until we're with him face to face. And that's how his faithfulness is too in our life. I was just, by happenstance, I was reading a little bit about Corey Ten Boom this week. And you know, she was 
freed from a Nazi concentration camp back in World War II. And she's still alive today, I think, and uh, has talked about it and written about it and all those things. And God was faithful to her getting her out of that concentration camp. Her sister, however, was killed in a Nazi concentration camp. So was God faithful to Corey Ten Boom and not her sister? No, we know he's, he's always faithful. He can't be faithful, but it doesn't always look the same in every scenario. You look at the first century church, the apostle James, he was the first pastor of the first church in Jerusalem and he was martyred. He was taken up to the top of the temple and thrown off and beaten until he was dead. And around that same time, Peter was in prison and he was miraculously released from prison. Was God faithful to Peter and not James? No, God's always faithful but it doesn't always look the same. It's not, we can't always know exactly what it's gonna look like. And for us, it's important to understand that the, faith of, or the faithfulness of God in our life is not only based on how it looks on, in earthly circumstances. Sometimes it is. We rejoice in those times when we can see it, but there's times that it's not going to be in our life. And we don't have to understand it to be able to know that God is faithful. You know, we can't understand, fully understand an infinite God with a finite mind. That's like trying to scoop out all the water out of the ocean with a solo cup. It just doesn't work. And we can't fully understand all the time. And frankly, the, the incessant need that some of us have in our faith, where we cannot get past this place, where we, are, we have this need to be able to uh, eliminate or, or get rid of the perplexity of God's faithfulness. And we have to understand that incessant need for that is one of the biggest hurdles to us really being able to rest in his faithfulness. And what it'll do actually for you is that it'll cause you to judge others that are able to rest in those situations that they don't understand. You might think of them as just being naive or, or simple when the reality is it actually takes more faith to be able to rest in his faithfulness when it doesn't make sense. It actually takes a level of maturity in faith. It's not simple at all. It's not naive. It's not being ignorant. It's actually being mature in your faith. And that's what God wants for us. That's the goal for us. And I think of Jeremiah, the great prophet of Israel back in the day. He wrote the book of uh, Lamentations where he is lamenting, which means to passionately grieve and sorrow. He's lamenting what happened to Israel, that Judah and Jerusalem had just been destroyed. And he writes this book talk, lamenting about it because he was so upset because this was the promised land that God had promised the Israelites all these years. They finally get into the promised land and now it is completely destroyed. It's, it's a heap, a smoldering heap with nothing left. And Jeremiah writes this book of Lamentations in the midst of all of this. And look what he says in Jeremiah, or, or Lamentations 3, verse 22. Most of you know this verse. There have been songs written about this passage. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Praise God. He is faithful. And that verse is wonderful if you just pull it out and read it out of context. But when you look at it in context, it's pretty tough. It's one thing to rejoice about God and talk about his faithfulness when things are good. It's another thing to talk about the faithfulness of God and rejoice in his faithfulness when your dreams and your goals and your, your plan and your vision for your life has been destroyed. And that's what Jeremiah is doing here. And that should be the goal for each and every one of us as followers of Jesus. My text that I read this morning out of Hebrews, it says that we can have full assurance because he who promised is faithful. Our assurance is in his faithfulness. Our assurance is not in our, our outcome. It's not in our situation. It's in our, his faithfulness. That's where the assurance comes from in our life. And if you're like me, there's times where you think, man, I really wish, I wish I could get it from the pages into my heart. Because there's times it just doesn't feel that way. There's times it doesn't feel like God is being faithful. Because I know what I want and he's not doing what I want sometimes. And that can be challenging for us. But I have grown in my own life to realize that the problem is never God's faithfulness. It's how I perceive it's supposed to look. That's what causes the issue in my own life and probably in yours too when we struggle with this. We're gonna show a video of a testimony of uh, William Dietzel, one of our own people here at New Hope. I've known William a long time. And uh, we're gonna see how God's faithfulness in his life looked a little different than maybe he would have hoped or even would have expected in the situation. So let's watch the screens. Hi, my name is William Dietzel. 
My family and I have been going to New Hope now for just over a year. That's not where the initial story started. We actually started attending New Hope almost nine or 10 years ago when they created a thing called The City. Uh, it was a small group, a uh, young adults group that, that started on Tuesday nights. And so fast forward a little bit, I'd gotten married. Uh, me and my wife found a, a church home, you know, in a, in a smaller church. That church kind of played its course and, and ran its, you know, role you know, in my life, that pastor retired. With that happening, it was kind of a, it was a big setback to me. I actually stopped going to church for almost a year. And that's not what Christ is. It's not just a structural building, you know, it should be more than that. And so in that season, there was a, a big thought in my head that, you know, it was, was I lost? Where was God? What were the steps that I was supposed to be taking? So coming out of that season, being lost and stuff, getting plugged back into a church body, everything was just kind of getting back on track, you know, back on the rails and, and getting back into church, getting back in the Word, things like that. And that's just really everyday stuff. That's not, you know, where you truly experience faithfulness. Routine church isn't really, you know, what I seek. Five, six months ago, I shattered my leg to the point to where it was pretty traumatizing for my whole family. Didn't know what was going to come out of it. Went from living every day, you know, again, quotation, normal life to not being able to function, <clears throat> couldn't walk, couldn't get around, you know, was in uh, the hospital for a week and a half, uh, come out after multiple surgeries and different stuff. Through that, um, I had the major reassurance that this wasn't just going to be a church that we attended, you know. I had so many people reach out to me to check on me, to help me, to do different things. God was saying, hey, you know, that you might be going through a tough, even terrible situation right now, but I'm going to reassure you that, you know, that I am faithful, that the things that you look for and strive for, you know, in a church that I'm going to reassure you that they're going to be here. In that struggle of my accident and stuff, like, I felt like God stepped up majorly with His faithfulness of, of reassuring me through all those steps, you know, and it was, I'd hit a little spell of, of depression through there and not knowing what I was supposed to do in life as far as what lesson I was supposed to learn from this. My plan for my life has never worked. <laughs> um, so it's that reassurance of following his plan and just seeing seeing where this season, you know, leads me. Obviously this is probably one of the worst accidents I've been through, but I've been through a lot in my life as far as different trials and stuff and and, you know, I can stand here today and tell you that through all those things that I never thought I would get through, that I never thought I could see any light through the other side, that God's always standing there, you know, with open arms to say, hey, like, I am faithful, you know, we are going to get through this together. So if I, if I had to narrow my thoughts of what God is down to, I guess, one word would be constant. He's, he's consistent through everything, through my whole life of being up and down to where, you know, never thought I'd possibly make it there. He has been the same all the way through all of them. When I have that, I can do it myself attitude. But then very quickly, I'm reminded that I can't go a, a single day without relying on God. And he's still there and he's still the same as he was you know, when I went through my struggle than I am with, you know, when I'm in my praising moments. Consistent would be the, the strongest word I would have to, to describe God. Yeah, amen. Uh, William's story, the short story that he shared there is a, a great example of the uh, perplexity of God's faithfulness in our life. That doesn't always look like we would have wanted it to look. You know, you could say, well, why, if God's faithful, why, you know, why, wouldn't it have been better if he kept him from that accident that he had, you know, protected him from that and walked him through that? 
Wouldn't it have been better for, for him and his family because it put strain on his job, I'm sure, and on his family and on his, his own uh, psyche. But I loved what he said there. He said that God showed him that, that he is faithful in the struggle. He's not just faithful to keep us from struggles. He's faithful when we get into those struggles in our life. That's the God we serve. That's the, the faithful God we serve. You know, God was faithful to the, to the Israelites. If you know the story in the Old Testament where they were slaves in Egypt and God brought them out of Egypt and they were in the desert for 40 years. They were supposed to go into the promised land, but their actual sin kept them out of the promised land. But even in that, God was still faithful. And their, their faithfulness, they would have wanted his faithfulness to look like getting into their promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land that, where they could have built their homes and had uh, you know, the, all the stuff that they wanted and been comfortable and at peace and predictability in their life. But instead, they're staying in the desert and they're wandering around. But even in that, God was still faithful. And this week in my, my Bible reading, just as I'm reading my, own, my Bible in my own personal time, I came across this verse that just really struck me because I already had the, uh, the faithfulness of God on my heart. When I read this, I thought, man, this is, this is so good. Out of uh, Deuteronomy 29, Verse five, it says, yet the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. In 40 years, their clothes did not wear out. Mine don't last a month half the time. <laughs> that was his faithfulness in their life. Their, their own sin got them in that situation, but he was still faithful. He said, you know what? You're not gonna be able to go into the promised land until the next generation, but I'm gonna make sure you got clothes and your sandals don't wear out. That's an, that's an incredible miracle to think that they, something like that could last that long. We can not think about that because it's not that big of a deal because we have all the clothes we need. But in that situation, if that's all you had, it's amazing how God was faithful in their struggle. And just because they didn't understand everything did not make him less faithful in their life. You know, uh, I wanna spend the rest of my time this morning sharing with you one of the, one of the more perplexing stories in all the Bible. It's the story of Jonah. And many of you are familiar with his story, at least somewhat familiar. Pretty much everybody knows that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and I, and I felt like God should show me some, some truth from it that even goes to his faithfulness in our life. And I just want to uh, share that with you today. It's, a, it's an outrageous story, the story of Jonah. Uh, it's so outrageous, in fact, some have suggested that it's an allegory, that it's not really what happened, that God just uses it in the Bible to kind of explain his character a little bit. But... Jesus put all that to rest when he was actually on earth. In Matthew, he said that just like Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days. So he confirmed that it actually did happen. And uh, I, I just briefly will summarize the, the story of Jonah. It's a small book in your Old Testament. Uh, he was a prophet of Israel. It's only like two pages in my Bible. And uh, God had called him to go preach to Nineveh, which was the capital city of Assyria at the time. And uh, he said, you know, the wickedness of these people has come up to me and I really want you to go preach to them so I don't have to destroy them. Well, Jonah didn't want to do that because Jonah was Jewish and the Assyrians were brutal to the Jews. They had mistreated them and bullied them and killed them, did lots of horrible stuff to them. So Jonah wanted God to judge them. He didn't want them to be forgiven. And so instead of going to Nineveh, when he goes down to the port to get on a ship, the ones going to Nineveh, he ignored that and got on one going the other way towards Tarshish. And while he's on this boat, God brings a big storm and the storm is so bad that everybody on the boat's like, we're gonna die. And Jonah finally realizes that the storm is here because of me, because I've been running from God. So he tells them to throw him off the boat. So they do, gladly. <laughs> they throw him off the boat and then that's where the fish swallows him. He's in the belly of a fish for three days. The fish eventually spits him back out on dry land. He goes to Nineveh, finally does what he's supposed to do, preaches to them, they repent and God does not have to destroy them. And the book of Jonah ends with Jonah complaining to God because of what he did to them. He's the only evangelist in the history of the world that was mad that the people listened to him. And uh, that's the story of Jonah. And so uh, the, the, the book of Jonah is not about a big fish, okay? It's a book about uh, God's mercy. Many people think that his mercy and grace is a New Testament concept. It was very evident in the Old Testament as well. And uh, it's, it's about his compassion, it's about his power, and it is about his faithfulness. And uh, what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna wanna show you a few things, that I, some, some stuff that I feel like the Lord has shown me out of this, that questions that I think we can ask ourselves when we're in situations where the circumstances don't necessarily look like God's being faithful, and maybe it's something we need to look at ourselves in the circumstances that we're in. 
Okay, and so the first thing we need to ask ourselves in light of the story of Jonah is am I on the wrong boat? You know, our life is like a voyage on a ship. Okay, if you'll go with me there. Uh, we're on this ocean of life and uh, we're on a ship and we're going, there, there's two directions to go. You can go towards God or you can go away from God. You're either going one way or the other in your life. And there are boats going the right way and the wrong way. And we have the option in our life to go on either one. And this isn't even necessarily talking about your salvation. Like this is, this can, this is relevant to any circumstance that we're in. Are we choosing to go God's way in this circumstance or are we choosing to go our own way? There are boats going both directions. In fact, Jonah got on the wrong boat. In Jonah 1 verse 3, it says very clearly, it says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So we know Jonah was fleeing from God. He got on the wrong boat. And the, re the, the reality is for us is that God has a plan for our life. He has a plan for you and for me. And there's, there's times in our life that God will prompt us to do something we don't wanna do. Or to go somewhere we don't wanna go. Or to give up something we don't wanna give up. Or to sacrifice more than we are willing to sacrifice. And it's in those moments that we have to decide which boat we're gonna get on. And oftentimes we get on the wrong boat we go on the wrong path in life, in these situations. And if we're not willing to do what God wants us to do in any situation, there will always be a plethora of boats going the wrong way. The choices are endless. In fact, the boats going the wrong way, they're actually luxury yachts. They're really, really nice. They're really comfortable. They're really peaceful. The, the, the horizon, the weather that way looks really good too. I mean, you can see the island off in the distance that would be really pretty to go and visit and everything's just picturesque and perfect. And the one going to Nineveh is a John boat. And it's an old one and it's rough and it doesn't even look like it might even not make it there. And the weather that way, the clouds look kind of dark and it just doesn't look that good. And so we come to, we make these decisions. Are we gonna take the, the narrow path as Jesus talked about that few take but leads to life? Or are we gonna take the wide path that many take that leads to death. There will always be more options to go away from God than to go towards him in our life. Every time, every decision we make, there's more options and many times those options are much more appealing to our flesh, much more appealing. And it can be very easy to get caught up in wanting to do what we wanna do. So we have to ask ourselves, am I running from God? Because really at the end of the day, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Whether or not it's God is not gonna be determined by how nice the situation looks. It's gonna be in your heart and you're gonna know if you're actually running from him. And we can justify anything you don't wanna do for God, anything you want to do what you wanna do, you can justify it and say, this has gotta be God. I mean, wouldn't God want me to go this way? I mean, this way is nice, you know? I'm, I'm blessed, I'm blessed and highly favored. I wanna go this way because, you know, even though it's not, yeah, I know God kinda of said something about that, but this just, I think, God will figure it out that I'm right, you know. Just give me a minute to figure that out. But if we're, on, if we're on the wrong boat, the faithfulness of God will look different than if we're on the right one. But the good news is, is that he's so, so good that when we, get, when we go in the wrong direction, when we choose the wrong path, when we go towards Tarshish instead of Nineveh, it doesn't necessarily disqualify us. See, God's not looking to disqualify us. You know, Jonah, when they threw him over the, the boat, he thought he was going to his watery grave. But the goodness of God does not stop there. He didn't take him to a watery grave. What he did, he, that wasn't his judgment. That was to redirect him. God's not looking to disqualify us because we make bad decisions. He's looking to redirect us. And that's what his faithfulness looks like in those situations. So we have to ask ourselves, am I on the wrong boat? In whatever scenario in your life right now where you are looking for the faithfulness of God, where you are asking God, God, I need, you, I need to see you in this, you need to ask yourselves, am I on the wrong boat? And then we also need to ask ourselves, is the storm that I'm in, is it from God? If you're in a storm right now, that you need to see the faithfulness of God, you need to ask yourself, is it from God? 
You know, it's nothing, it's not new news to us that there are storms in life that are constant. In fact, the storms in our life are, when, are, are what inspire us and motivate us to really wanna see God's faithfulness. Those are the times I wanna see God show up. When life's good and everything's good, I'm, you know, so I'm fine. But when, it, it, when, it's, when I'm uncomfortable, when I'm in a situation that I don't like, God, let's see some faithfulness. Let's see it show up in my life. The storms are what cause us to want to see that more in our life. And some of the storms we deal with in life, they're just, they're not earth shattering, they're just annoying. But some of them are really rough. Some of you are going through some really rough storms right now. That's, I can guarantee you that. Some of you might've just come out of some, some of you are about to go into some. Because that's how life is, it's full of storms. And sometimes these storms aren't, sometimes they just happen because life happens. Because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes they're, they're results of bad decisions we make. But sometimes they are from God. And I know this is hard for many of us as Christians to accept that God would actually bring storms in my life. Now, let me be very, very clear. God does not bring evil into our life. But God will absolutely bring storms into our life. There is absolutely no question. But it's easy for us to get caught up in thinking, ah, that can't be. Like, we don't even consider that what we're going through was ordained by God. Because we want to believe that God just loves me so much that he would never, never initiate this in my life. And let me just tell you, God does love you so much. He loves me so much. God so loved the world that he sent his son. His love for us is the greatest love that mankind has ever experienced. It's beyond words, actually. You can't even fully comprehend the love of God in our life. That's how much he loves us. But I can also tell you that his love for you is not his primary motivation in your life. It's actually secondary. His primary motivation in your life, the reason he created you, the reason you are here today and living in, on earth, the purpose for your life is to glorify him. He is about bringing glory to his name first and foremost, and there's really nothing even close to it. It is about his glory. The reason you were created was for his glory. Now he loves you, but it is about his glory first. And if he has to bring a storm into your life to bring more glory to him, he will choose it every time. Every time, church. Now, I know this might go against some of the teaching you've had in your life, but I'm telling you, it is so clear in the word of God that if you have to not wanna see it to not see it. It's all over the place. And it is not something to be scared of because when God brings storms into our life, they are to purify us. They are to make us better. They are to make us more like him. They are to bring us closer to him, into his presence. They're good things, but they're uncomfortable. But he will definitely bring them. I wanna give you just two very quick examples just so you don't think I'm standing up here spouting off heresy. But the Bible tells us that he disciplines us. Hebrews 12, in verse five, he says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. I don't know about how it was in your home growing up, but in my home, discipline and punishment felt like a storm. There was suffering involved. Whether it was my backside or if it was just blessings being removed from my life for a season. And to think that God doesn't do the same thing. That's what discipline is. That's what punishment is in our life. It doesn't make him any less full of grace if he punishes us. It doesn't make him any less merciful if he disciplines us in our life. It actually makes him, proves who he is. It proves his mercy and it proves his grace for us in our life, just like you do with your kids. The exact same thing. He also tests us. Proverbs 17, three is just one verse about testing that most of you know this verse. It says the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. That sounds so cute, doesn't it? It looks so good on a bumper sticker or on a sticky note on my mirror. But a crucible was a thing used that they turned up the heat to purify silver and gold. It was a storm for the silver and gold. And God's saying here, like, I don't use a crucible, I do it myself for my people. 
So he turns up the heat in our life. He brings storms in our life to make us uncomfortable, to purify us. He, and it's not just, I know there's some, some talk out there, there's some, you know, belief that God, well, he doesn't initiate, he just allows it. No, no, he initiates it sometimes. He will bring things in to purify us, to cause us to be more like him. And church, I'm telling you, we should celebrate that. We should absolutely celebrate that because storms are gonna come in your life. If a storm's gonna come in my life, I would rather it was one that God was bringing than one that was coming because of my own sin or one that's coming because of my own shortcomings or because of the enemy. I would rather it come from him because I know if he's bringing it, it's gonna be good at the end. So he tests us. It's, and, and it's exactly what he did for Jonah. He brings storms into our life to wake us up. He brought a storm into Jonah's life to wake him up. In fact, in uh, Jonah 2, verse 6, this is while he was in the belly of the fish, this was his prayer. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever, but you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. This was while he was in the fish. He's not, this isn't something he said afterwards. He says that I was imprisoned in the earth, he had, to be, he had to be brought into a situation with a pretty bad storm in his life to wake up to realize, you know what? I was in prison while I was out there. Now I'm actually free being in the belly of a fish because of the storm that God brought in his life. The storm was not his judgment. It was his deliverance. And the storms that God brings into our life are not judgment, they're deliverance. Deliverance from what, pastor? Deliverance from yourself which is what every one of us needs. Because in our best day, we are still very sinful on our own. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to our heavenly father without the spirit of God in us. So, that, so, so these, uh, this, this deliverance that he brought Jonah is exactly what he does for us. So we have to ask, is this storm from God? If you're in a storm right now, and if it is from God, I'm telling you, if you try to fight against a God-ordained storm, <laughs> you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. It is about giving yourself to it, allowing him to do what he wants to do in it, and he will bring you through it. It's easy to think that God's faithfulness always looks great in the moment. That when God shows his faithfulness in my life, it's gonna be a moment of celebration. It's gonna be a moment of rejoicing, of jubilee, of closure, of resolve of my issues. Sometimes it looks like a storm in our life. The third question we need to ask ourselves, am I allowing Jonah to stay in the boat? So we're gonna switch perspectives. We're not Jonah any longer now. Now we're the sailors that are with Jonah, okay? Can you trek with me? <laughs> From the sailors' perspective, they were on the right boat. They weren't in overt rebellion with God. They weren't trying to run away from a call God had on their life. They were just on a boat going to Tarshish because that's where they were going but yet they were thrown into a storm. And it was a storm that had nothing to do with any of their efforts. It was a storm that wasn't because of their own disobedience or their rebellion or their wickedness. It, was, it wasn't a storm for, for that reason at all. It was a storm because they had allowed something else to come into their life and they're reaping what that thing sowed. It was because they had given themselves, they had allowed something else to be there. So maybe even in your life, maybe you're wanting to honor God in your life. Maybe you are choosing the path of God. Maybe, you've, maybe you're on the John boat. You're taking the right path. You're wanting to honor God. You're wanting to do what he wants you to do. You want to go in the right direction, but you've allowed a stowaway to come with you. Now, this isn't necessarily a person, okay? I know it is in this story, but in our life, it can be anything. Anything that we are allowing to stay with us that doesn't need to be there. Maybe you were afraid to get rid of it. Maybe, we're, maybe we kind of enjoy having it. Maybe there's a situation in your life that you're in a circumstance and you know that you've allowed something to come with you that really doesn't need to be there. And I can tell you today that the storms in your life are going to continue until you get that thing off the boat until you get rid of it. Because once you know, you're accountable. You're accountable for what you know. 
See, these sailors, they were kind of innocent victims at the time, but then they finally realized that this Jonah was the reason that they were going through this. So now they're accountable for what they know. So they banded together and put Jonah's feet in their hands and went, whoop, <laughs> and got rid of him. We're accountable for what we know. And just like Jonah, we need to throw, I mean, just like the sailors, we need to throw Jonah off the ship. Throw him off that boat. Do not let it stay there. I'm gonna read Jonah 1, verses 11 and 12. It says, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And then we go down to verse 15. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. It's a pretty extreme thing. But if we want the faithfulness of, of God to show in our life, if we, are, if we really wanna see it like we say we wanna see it, like the way we sing it, sometimes we have to get radical. And when God has pointed something out in your life, we has, when he has revealed something, when he has highlighted something and illuminated something in your life that you know should not be on your ship of life, then it's time to get rid of it. And we need to be aggressive against it, praise God. Don't let Jonah destroy God's plan for your life because he can. Don't be naive thinking that the will of God is just always gonna be accomplished in my life. The will of God is not always accomplished in our life, church. There's a reason Jesus said to pray that his will would be done because it's not always done. So Jonah can destroy the plan of God for your life. Don't try to manage it, get rid of it. Do you ever wonder when you read this, you ever wonder why Jonah didn't just jump out of the boat himself and jump into the water? When he realized he was the problem and he said, hey guys, throw me in, get rid of me. Why didn't he just say, hey, sorry, I know I'm the problem guys, sorry, see ya, and jump out. Why didn't he just do it himself? Is it just, just the writing that isn't a, isn't a big deal? I think it's actually very significant because Jonah in this story, in this part of the story especially, he represents rebellion. He represents sin. He represents running from God. Nothing good about anything he was doing. Yes, he was a prophet. Yes, he gets a book in the Bible. Yes, he got to preach to the Ninevites and they repented. But in, the, in this part of this story, there's nothing good. The only reason he's even here in, in any way is because of God's mercy in his life. So he is representing rebellion. He's representing sin. He's representing running away from God. So if Jonah is representing sin, do you really think sin in your life is ever going to get rid of itself? Never. The sin in your life will never say, you know what, I've been, I've been tormenting you long enough. It's time for me to go. I'm doing a backflip off the boat here. Never, ever. The sin in our life, the sin nature, the enemy of your soul, everything about the flesh in our life, it never, ever gets enough. And it never, ever will jump off the boat by itself. It's going, it, you might recognize it, and when you recognize it is when you have to take action and be determined to say, you're not staying. I'm throwing you off whether you want me to or not. I'm getting rid of it. The writer of Hebrews tells us that we are to throw off the sin that easily entangles us. Why doesn't it just say, you know what, just walk away from it? Because it'll follow you. We have to be aggressive against those things in our life that are causing us to go away from God, whatever it is. Church, it could be something that's not even bad if you just look at it out of context. It could be a relationship that it, out of context doesn't look bad, but you know that it's going, taking you away from God. It could be something about your finances where you just know that what you're doing is taking you away from what God would want for you to do. It could be a million different things. And only you know your heart and God reveals those things to us. And when he does, he says, throw it off, throw it overboard. Do not let this thing destroy your life. Do not look at sin lightly and think it's not that big of a deal. Well, I don't deal with, a, I don't have a lot of problems. I just, you know, I have a little bit of greed, big deal. Everybody has greed. Get rid of it, deal with it aggressively. Come in the opposite spirit of those things in our life. We have to deal with it in our life. We cannot allow Jonah to stay on our boat. 
because it will destroy God's plan for your life. Stand with me, please, church, as we close this, this afternoon. Praise God. We have to ask ourselves, am I on the wrong boat? Is the storm from God? And am I letting Jonah stay? I wanna encourage you as we pray to just search your heart. Let God search your heart today. Let him reveal to you. He is always faithful in our life. Sometimes how it looks is perplexing. But sometimes we can do things that can thwart it in our life. We can be like Jonah and have to go through more than we really would have had to go through. If we just obey, it could actually go a lot smoother in some respects. But you might be obeying all you know to obey and still having storms in life. It could be all over the place, but we know God is faithful. And I wanna pray for us this, this afternoon that our hearts would know that he's faithful. It wouldn't just be something we know because we've read it or because other people are saying it, but we would know it in our heart. That we'd be able to rejoice in his faithfulness like Jeremiah did after their, their whole culture had been destroyed. None of us have dealt with more than what Jeremiah was dealing with in that moment, yet he said, great is your faithfulness. Praise God. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we do love you today. Thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that it is your word that transforms us, Lord, that makes us more like you, that draws us to you, God. And Lord, today we just, we know that you are faithful. We know what our Bible says. We, we believe it, but God, we wanna believe it more. We wanna be able to rest in your faithfulness no matter what. To be able to be like Jeremiah in the midst of a storm and say, great is your faithfulness. God, would you help us today to ask ourselves the tough questions? Am I on the wrong boat? Do I need to get on a different boat? Is the storm I'm going through, is it from you? Or is it something that I've created? And am I letting Jonah stay on my boat? God, would you help us? Help us, Lord, to want more of you more than we want anything else in this life, no matter what it is. No matter what it is, more of you and less of us. Let that be our heart's cry in every way, God. I pray you would reveal yourself to everybody under the sound of my voice in this moment. Show us, Lord, show us where we have gotten on the wrong boat and gone the wrong direction and rejected. If we're in rebellion, Lord, reveal it. God, if there's sin in any of our lives that needs to be dealt with, God, would you reveal it? Help us to repent of it, God. Help us to turn away, to walk away from it, Lord, and to trust you, even though it may be the harder decision, even though it may not make sense. God, we want you to receive glory in our lives. To you be all the glory, honor, and power forever and ever. Glorify yourself through our lives. Glorify yourself through this church, through the people of this church, Lord. I pray, God, that your glory would be revealed in such a way, God, that we would affect the lives of other people around us, that your light would shine, Lord, in such a powerful way, Lord, that we would be a city on a hill, that people would be drawn to you through the, the, the glory of God in us and our relationship with you, that we would be able to affect culture and culture would not affect us. Do your work in each one of us, God. We love you and we thank you for all that you do and for all that you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you.